uh, with the participation of Claudia Vilara Lehman, Avni Pravin, and Elena Crete. Uh, global and local perspectives on a just energy transition. Uh, I want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, both our program and our department, but also the School of Architecture, as well as New America's Planetary Politics Initiative, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and their Environmental Justice Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers Program. Uh, before we move forward into the events, I just want to let you know that our program uh, collaborates with partners such as these and our amazing faculty, students, and local communities, local and global communities uh, throughout the year. We have another event this week that's sold out, but we will have more urban heat walks and microclimate walks in the coming months with our faculty, Yule Juban. Uh, we also have on October 16th a uh, research presentation by our Natura Network of uh, Nature-Based Solutions Fellow, Franklin Kirimi from Conque Design Initiative in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, more, event, more on that will come later. As well as on the no first week of November, Pratt Earth Action Week is happening. Events are being proposed internally. We'll be sharing them as they're finalized, but one that will happen is a public panel on participatory science and education on the water as part of our Delta Cities Coastal Resilience Studio. Uh, you can find out more via the QR code or through our Instagram at Pratt uh, underscore SES. Uh, with that said, thanks again all for attending, and I'm going to pass it on to Summer. Summer? Awesome. Thank you so much, Lano. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Happy Climate Week. We hope that you've been joining some amazing events and really deeply appreciate you spending your time with us here tonight. So we're very excited about the fun conversation we're going to have with these amazing panelists. We have Four amazing women in energy, um, and we're going to get into um, just great conversation topics about what it will take um, to implement and operationalize a just energy transition. So first, um, to start off, my name is Sama Sandoval. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an assistant visiting professor at Pratt Institute. I'm also um, the Environmental Justice um, Federal Funding Lead at the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, USDN. I want to... Um, um, introduce our fellow panelists here. So we have Martha Malfedez, who's the co-organizer of this event, also a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute and a senior fellow at New America. We're also joined by Elena Crete, who is the head of climate and energy um, at Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN. And we're also joined by Claudia villar Limen, um, Senior Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at New York Best, um, as well as Adney Pravin, um, the Deputy Director of Alliance for a Green Economy, or GREE. So super thrilled to be joined um, by you all tonight. And um, before we get started, we want to give a little bit more background um, on some of our co-sponsors tonight. Um, so the first co-sponsor we want to share a little bit more about is the Pratt Master of Science and Sustainability and um, Sustainable Environmental Systems Program. It's one of the nation's most innovative interdisciplinary systems-based sustainability programs. The STEM certified degree program is designed to meet today's increasing demand for environmental professionals uniquely combining environmental science, sustainable design, and climate policy. Um, students learn the interdisciplinary skills and systems thinking approach needed to assess um, con contemporary environmental issues, catalyze innovative environmental problem solving, and uphold environmental and social justice, and engage diverse stakeholders in designing and developing sustainable communities. Our next co-sponsor of um, this program is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, USDN works to create equitable, resilient, and sustainable communities by advancing the field of local government sustainability and equipping practitioners to be catalysts of transfer transformative change. Um, the next co-sponsor we want to highlight here is the Environmental Justice Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Center, um, also known as the EJ Tic Tacs, um, the Environmental Justice Thriving Community Technical Assistance Centers are a collaborative initiative of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the U.S. Department of Energy, the DOE, and provides free technical assistance to community-based organizations 
tribes, and local governments across the country to access federal funding. The TikToks work directly with stakeholders to support local programs and projects that address place-based environmental and climate justice concerns. There are 18 um, TikToks across the country, 15 regional and three national centers. USDN is part of one of the three national centers. So um, if you're part of a local government or a CBO who's interested in access accessing federal funding, um, please reach out to your regional and national TikTok. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Martha to introduce um, our other two co-sponsors for tonight. Um, thank you, Summer. Um, yeah, so um, we also have New America's Planetary Politics um, Initiative or program. Um, this is a unique initiative, which is a call to action for reimagining a more inclusive, equitable and sustainable global order. Um, just given the reality that as our world becomes hotter, wetter, and more complex, um, the time to build new global institutions attuned to today's realities and lived environment um, in preparation for tomorrow is now. Um, encourage you to follow us on Twitter um, and check out our website. Um, there's also the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, they work under the auspice of the UN Secretary General to mobilize the world's universities, think tanks, and national laboratories for action on the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Um, they empower societies through free online education, translate scientific evidence and ideas into solutions and accountability. Um, and I'll kick it back to Summer to get the conversation started. Thanks, Martha. And before we jump into our questions, I just want to do a little bit of table setting in terms of grounding us within the political moment we're in. So this week, as most of you know, is a very special week, a special time of year in New York City in particular. Um, it's New York City Climate Week, as well as the UN General Assembly. So we're really seeing, um, you know, thousands and thousands of climate, sustainability, and resilience professionals coming into New York City from across the country and across the globe to have important conversations. Um, we're also in the midst of, you know, what folks are calling unprecedented or once in a lifetime federal funding within clean energy, um, environmental justice, um, and, and infrastructure with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. We're, we've also, um, you know, at crossing these really major milestones or anniversaries as well, where um, we actually just um, passed the 10 year anniversary of the People's Climate March back in New York City in 2014, um, two days ago on the 21st. We're also coming up on the 12 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy that devastated so many um, frontline communities in New York City. And you know we're still seeing the impacts of Superstorm Sandy today. Um, and so we're also um, five years, we just passed this summer, five years from the passing, um, from New York State passing the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, one of the, um, the nation's most progressive and aggressive and ambitious climate legislations um, in the country and some say in the world. And so we're going to have important conversations today just about this moment. What do we need to do to make sure that a clean energy transition is indeed a just transition? Are we on track to meet our targets? And, you know, what is there to celebrate and look forward to? And, you know, what, what are some lessons learned and some important actions that we really need to take? Um, so with that, I'm going to start um, by the first few rounds of questions. I also want to remind um, attendees, uh, if you have questions throughout the conversation, please feel free to populate them in the chat box. Um, you can also save your questions to the end. If you're going to be um, staying until the end, we'll have an open Q&A where you can come up mute and ask your questions directly as well. So first few questions um, to my panelists. So the first question is, can you share in a sentence or two what inspires you to do the work that you do? So a quick little opener. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Claudia. Great, thanks so much Summer and Martha for inviting me and for hosting this event. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So as mentioned, I'm Claudia Vijay-Gleeman. I'm here representing New York Best, the New York Battery and Energy Storage Technology Consortium. Um, but I guess before I get into the work that I do now, maybe I'll tell a quick story of what cemented my decision to work in climate policy in the first place. 
Um, so I come to this space from a natural sciences background. Uh, I studied ecology in undergrad and climate science in grad school. Um, but back in 2015, I had the opportunity to accept a fellowship to teach biology and climate science at this really cool science-oriented high school in Dominican Republic. Um, and while I love the science side of things, I also really wanted to help students focus on the human side of climate change, um, especially how it will affect them in their home country and not just think about it as an abstract science problem. Um, so I took them on this field trip to interview residents of a little desert town called Boca de Cachon, um, which had been recently constructed by the government to actually resettle people um, who had been displaced by rising waters of a very large lake in Western DR called Lago Antiquillo. Um, it's a lake that's more than doubled in size in the last decade, presumably because of climate change. Um, and on the surface, building this new town to help people who are displaced by rising water uh, sounded like an appropriate government response for climate adaptation. Um, but when students interviewed residents directly for their project they were working on, what we heard was a totally different story. Um, it actually turned out the government had forcibly relocated people that were living along the lake and forced them to move to this town that they'd built in the middle, middle of the desert, um, but it was not properly constructed and did not have piped water infrastructure. So residents relied on drinking water being trucked in from an hour away um, and the truck service was super unreliable. And then even worse, getting water from the trucks was limited to Dominicans who could prove their citizenship. And this was around the time that the government was rewriting laws to say you can only be a Dominican citizen if your grandparents were citizens, um, which was intended to strip Haitian immigrants as well as Dominicans of Haitian descent uh, of their citizenship rights. And in this case, also their basic human rights to access drinking water. Um, so what was on the surface, a story about climate adaptation was really just as much a story about racism and inequity and all the ways that climate impacts like flooding and drought and resource shortages um, exacerbate existing social problems. So I decided from there that I really wanted to pursue a career in climate policy um, to help transition to a more equitable energy system in support of these broader social justice goals um, and use the societal transformation that is required to address climate change as an opportunity uh, to not just build a lower emission system, but also a more equitable system. Um, and so for a long time, I actually thought I wanted to work internationally on climate issues, especially in Latin America. Um, and while I very much admire people who chose that path and maybe would have done that in another life, um, as someone born and raised in New York City, I decided to focus on what I can do here at home. Uh, we live in a super emissions intensive country, and I feel like I wanted to help cut emissions as quickly as possible here to help reduce impacts elsewhere. Um, and also reduce impacts right here in New York City, where we, of course, have our own climate injustice stories. So now I'm super zeroed in on ensuring that New York's energy transition happens successfully and equitably and as quickly as possible um, with those kind of global climate justice issues still serving as a lot of the inspiration to do the work that I do. Thank you so much, Claudia, for sharing that anecdote. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Lena. Um, what inspires you to do the work that you do? Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Happy to be here today alongside these amazing panelists. Um, I think I have a, a quick two prong story. Uh, one, I grew up in New Hampshire. Uh, so I literally grew up as a very dirty child playing in the woods uh, and gardening with my mother and just having an inherent passion for nature. Um, and that really did, when I went to college, I knew I needed to do something in the line of conservation or environmental stewardship. Um, and energy just struck my interest and took me in the climate mitigation space. Uh, the, the second part of it is the more modern part where, unfortunately, in my country, climate and working in climate is actually a divisive topic to raise uh, in a local community in upstate New York. Um, however, on the international stage, it can really be a connector and it can bring people together and it can be something that we have in common and that we're really working towards uh, uh, implementing the solutions and finding the policies and identifying really that path to uh, 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 climate balance and carbon balance globally. So uh, nowadays it's more about uh, doing that mission together uh, internationally. I'll stop there. Let's pass it to Martha. What inspires you to do the work that you do? Um, you know, uh, for anyone who knows me, they know I'm from Florida. Um, <laughs> And paradise has got problems, um, but also I'm an elder millennial um, and I can kind of chart my life along the course of, 
us acknowledging scientifically that this is a problem sometime around my birth <laughs> and to climate denialism at home, um, climate acceptance elsewhere. Um, and some of the small actions that we're seeing today, um, I'm from a small beach town um, in Florida, and I've seen firsthand how climate shocks can impact lives and livelihoods. Um, when I was in high school, we had one, I think it was our junior year, we had five hurricanes within a two month period. So, you know, it was this back to back to back. Um, and, you know, there's this big disconnect between understanding how our actions can like both propel cl our climate reality, but also can um, stall it. So for me, climate is an energy challenge um, in the cause and in the solution. Um, and that's why I do the work I do. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you pass it over to Athy. What, um, what inspires you to do the work that you do? Thanks, Summer. And thanks, Summer and Martha, for inviting me to be on here with this awesome panel. Um, so I will just say briefly that um, I grew up in New York State. My family is originally from the Global South, um, Gujarat, um, a province in India. Um, and I think my first awareness um, of climate change and kind of an inaccess um, inequitable access to amenities, especially green space and clean air and water um, came from uh, being a kid running around um, beautiful green New York and then um, visiting my family in the global South and recognizing that um, the water wasn't always safe to drink and um, the air wasn't always safe to breathe. Um, and so I really started on this very um, zoomed out lens of um, equity and access. Um, and sorry for the siren that's going by on my street right now. Um, but when I started getting into um, climate science and um, kind of green space equity work um, and outdoor education work, um, I read an amazing book and I'm just going to plug it right now because I feel like everyone should read it. Um, it changed my thinking completely. Uh, it's called The Rise of the American Conservation Movement. It's by Dorsita Taylor. Um, she's an amazing scholar that often um, publishes kind of uh, diversity and equity reports in the in green spaces. Um, and it really reminded me that our environmental movement in the US needs a lot of work if it's not going to be classist, if it's not going to be racist, if it's going to be inclusive and um, break down um, systemic barriers um, and all the ways that um, people of color and low income people have been redlined out of um, accessing uh, resources and amenities. Um, so I'll just say that I'll bring it back to um, kind of a global perspective, um, even though I guess I'm one of the local presenters. Um, but I just think we also, as a Western nation, we owe such a massive debt to countries in the global South um, for our role as emitters. And you know we owe it to the people who are experiencing unprecedented flat floods and droughts and famines and sea level rise. And as a result, the displacement of whole communities and in some cases countries. Um, so I feel like we kind of owe it to other countries and also BIPOC communities here in the US who are the first and worst impacted by climate events to act with urgency and ambition and probably most importantly, hope. Thank you so much, Avni, and thank you everyone for those answers. So the next question, we have a, has a few different parts and we'll go in reverse order. So we'll start with you, Avni, this time. Um, so what is a just energy transition um, to you? What was success look like? And thirdly, as a woman in the energy transition space, what's one thing you wish people knew or understood? Yeah, should I go through all of those questions um, before passing it? Okay. So first question was, um, what would a just energy transition look like to you? And what would success look like? Cool. So, um, in a lot of coalition spaces, we kind of do this exercise of like, you know, write out a headline of like what you want the world to look like, or what do you think this work should do? What would a headline be if we were able to capture media attention um, and win the things that we want? Um, so I, I did that because it helps me organize my thoughts. 
Um, so my headline is, in a massive win for community ownership and building decarbonization, state announces largest publicly owned climate resilient geothermal network that will serve over 20,000 homes in low income communities. Um, and that's not a very good headline because it's very long, but the sub headline to that to make it even longer would be the project will generate 1000 union livable wage and career track jobs earmarked for residents of the host community. Estimates show that energy burden is eliminated across project participants bills. Um, so there's a lot of elements there. I think success looks like um, creating green jobs, but they can't just be jobs. Like they, they need to be livable wage. They need to be family sustaining. Um, they need to be created in the communities that are consistently locked out of um, these, these uh, careers and jobs. Um, they need to help reduce people's um, energy burdens. We have way too many people in the state who are choosing between heating and eating and um, accessing medicine um, and other care that they need. Um, and yeah, we want, we want publicly owned. We um, are witnessing so much how corporations being in control of our and our assets and our futures is just it's not working out for us. Um, and I think history has a pretty bad track record of that. So um, I think that's all, all of the elements that I included in my answer. Um, and then as a woman in the energy transition space, um, I can really just maybe speak to some of the experiences I've had in um, campaign and coalition spaces. Um, yeah, I guess I just want to encourage people to recognize that there's, um, you know, even though uh, many of us are here because our jobs are located in the energy transition space, there's also a lot of unpaid labor that happens in these coalition and campaign spaces. Um, and it can be as small a thing as like, you're on a call and someone asks for a note taker. Um, I often see women of color taking on these positions of unpaid labor or these extra volunteer opportunities. Um, in some of our campaign spaces, we did like fun hot chili tours where we, we made chili and then we invited people to eat it and learn about the New York Heat Act, which I might mention a little bit later. Um, and I often noticed that the people making that chili, doing the grocery shopping for snacks, like making sure that people were comfortable at these events, making sure there was childcare taken care of. Um, I often noticed that those were femme individuals and especially femme people of color um, taking on those roles. So yeah, I think the more that we notice that and the more we call it out and the more we encourage other people to be leaders and create that leaderful movement, um, the more we can break down, um, yeah, patriarchal domination in our movement spaces. Thank you so much, Apni, for sharing the, um, the that answer. I think it hits on so many important parts from, from the patriarchy to community ownership. So just really appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Martha for the question and put it in the chat. So hopefully that'll also help with the three-parter. So what is the energy, uh, what does a just energy transition to you? What does, what would success look like? And as a woman in energy transition space, what's one thing you wish people knew or understood? Yeah, thank you, Summer. Um, I mean, it's worth sharing a little bit about my, my background to help kind of add color to like why I'm gonna respond the way I'm gonna respond. Um, so my work's been very international focused um, on conflict um, and conflict resources, as well as energy policy and climate for just a variety of different types of places, whether it's think tanks or development um, orgs or advocacy groups. Um, so just worth adding that color. So for me, a just energy transition um, would ensure that climate and energy responses create a regenerative society where we are untethered to exploit, exploit, exploitive and exploitative processes, um, one that prioritizes equity, includes indigenous and frontline communities, um, all while expanding energy access um, in tandem with climate and sustainable development goals. I know that's a mouthful, but um, I've read a lot of definitions of what a just energy transition should be um, for some of my work with New America. So um, yeah, that's kind of my amalgamated definition. Um, but what does that mean? So that means resource curse maybe isn't a thing anymore. Maybe it means we can, over time, start to actually recycle the critical minerals that we're going to need um, instead of just mining to death because everything is finite. 
Um, and yeah, I think, you know, success, this is always a hard one because often success gets tethered to hope. Um, and I have to say like, you know, hope is not a strategy. Um, I know that's kind of like an unkind thing to say, um, but it just isn't. We have to think strategically and be determined to find solutions that are actionable and tangible um, and also possible. Um, so I think we need to have everything moving in concert. We need the finance, we need the political will, we need, um, and we need like, we need technological solutions um, and we need people to be willing to be a part of the solutions. Um, you know, I already kind of alluded to like a world where no one is left behind or left worse off by energy transition. Um, and I already talked a little bit about like resource curse and like where resource resource rich communities can actually benefit from their resources. This is a real travesty of our time um, that many um, nations that are resource rich um, communities within, they don't fully really benefit from their resources. Um, and, um, you know, as a woman in the energy transition space, I think, you know, just to link back to climate, I wish people understood that women globally are disproportionately affected by climate shocks and by climate impacts. Um, women are often the ones who are taken out of school to have to go fetch water further and further distances. Um, rates of gender-based violence tend to increase when there are no lamps around at night. Um, so something as simple as just having electricity can help women have more full and complete lives. But I think just in general, um, as someone who likes to call out things that maybe make people feel uncomfortable, um, I wish people understood that we collectively, as a global collective, um, give seven trillion dollars in fossil fuel subsidies um indirect and indirect subsidies these are our tax dollars hard-earned tax dollars i might add um that we're basically funding our fossil fuel development that is funding our own kind of demise on the climate front so these things are connected right um we also have a lot of new de oil development and coal development and and uh, gas development that's happening you know right you know, today globally. Um, and each new mine that opens up today is setting us up for future emissions a decade or two into the future. So, you know, this is an important part of the conversation that often gets isolated to the people who are like, are really interested in resource development. <laughs> it doesn't get part it, thrown into the climate uh, space and it doesn't often get included in the decarbonization conversation. Um, and I guess my last point in terms of something I think everyone needs to think of is that, you know, our climate and energy nexus problems are really a problem of political leadership um, and without getting overly political or risking anyone's, you know, 501c3 status. I'm just going to say that I wish people understood their own agency. We all have agency and the choices we make every day and what we, you know, we all vote with our wallets, of course, but we all should be voting at the ballot box and, um, you know, Voting isn't marriage, it's public transportation. It's about getting us closer to the world that we want um, up and down ballot. And I'll stop talking now. Thank you, Marta. Hope isn't a strategy. You're going to use that one and say it a little bit louder for the folks in the back. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Elena. Yeah, I, I think a lot of great things have already been said, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, but not surprisingly, given my background and that I work with the SDSN, which is all about in implementing the SDGs, um, I frame a just energy transition within the framework of the SDGs. So thinking about it being affordable, reliable, accessible, modern, and sustainable energy. And in, in that line of, of adjectives, the access one really sticks out to me in the fact that there are still around 700 million people people in the world that don't have access to energy. And so a key starting point is making sure that we get them that sustainable access. Um, and in my mind, there's really two key enablers for that. Uh, and this is based really on my work at SDSN. It, it's very heavily uh, pathway planning and uh, policy recommendations. Um, so first is the technologies. Um, so a lot of our pathway work has shown that electrification is a big part of this solution. So making sure to modernize and expand our grids, um, but also enabling the transfer of digital solutions from countries who currently have them and are really designing them for purpose, making sure that we transition those more to the emergency 
emerging country context and giving that leapfrog advantage for those countries who are currently building those grids of the future, supported by large scale renewables. Um, and then the second prong to that is the financing. And this is what we've been hearing all year long. This is going to be a huge topic at this year's conference of parties uh, in a, a month or two. Um, and it's really about enabling access to finance and affordable capital, um, because renewable energy uh, requires a large upfront capital expenditure, which is much different than the financing for fossil fuels. Um, and that's really what makes it so challenging uh, to build them specifically in a, 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 a credit restrained environment. Um, and honestly, access to credit really does take trust and long term relationships. Um, and so really trying to build on that to help enable access to credit, I think is going to be a huge part of the, the just transition. Um, I'll stop there. And Yeah, so I guess thinking about success in New York, um, I work in the electricity sector. So, you know, getting to a fully clean electrical grid is especially important, especially, you know, as we transition to a clean energy economy, we're going to be electrifying a ton of end uses that didn't used to depend on electricity, like transportation and heating and things that are central to people's safety and well being. So making sure that we have a clean and reliable electric system is even more important. So I guess when I'm thinking about what does success look like in New York? There's three kind of components of what we want, how we pay for it, and how we build it. And I guess what we want would be a transition to a fully zero emissions electric grid that's reliably powering a pretty widely electrified and efficient society with clean air and reclaiming sites that were previously used for fossil infrastructure for clean energy and community-based or nature-based solutions. Um, in terms of how we pay for it, I think there's a lot of opportunity to reform uh, subsidies as well as market structures to move away from funding fossil based infrastructure and funding new clean energy investments instead. Um, I think there's an opportunity in New York to move to a progressive tax based structure rather than having everything funded through rates, which are regressive and not income based. Um, so that can help reduce uh, high rates, especially um, with a focus on eliminating energy cost burden for, for New Yorkers who currently pay more than 6% of their income on energy bills. Um, and then in terms of how we build that, ensuring that all of the new resources, the clean energy, the energy storage, the new transmission lines um, are built, you know, in the near term with raw materials that are sustainably and humanely sourced, but then in the long term, increasingly recycled materials. So building up our recycling capacity, like tremendously is going to be super important for long, long term sustainability in this space. Um, and then, of course, having all that work be done by an inclusive workforce that reflects the brilliant diversity of our state, which it very much does not at the current moment. Um, so I guess transitioning into the women in energy question. Uh, yes, I agree. Women are significantly underrepresented, uh, underrepresented in this space, but um, definitely don't think it's a reason to not join if you're a woman considering <laughs> entering the energy sector. It's a really exciting opportunity. And I do think there's a lot of change happening. Um, I am often the only woman in the meeting, but more and more we're seeing more young young women joining the, the sector. And I think for me, I had such amazing women mentors early in my career, which was really a game changer for me and made me even more determined to stick with it. Um, and I would just put a plug for the many great mentorship programs that are out there that really helped me. Um, CLI, Clean Energy Leadership Institute, is a great program that can connect you with wonderful mentors in the space. Uh, YPE NYC, Young Professionals in Energy, the New York City chapter, is a really awesome resource, and they have a mentorship program specifically for undergrads. Um, and Latinos in Sustainability also has a really great energy slash sustainability focused um, mentorship program. So I'm sure there's many more than, than just those. Those were three that I really benefited from, but definitely would want to make sure that folks know about those resources so they can take advantage of them if they're considering um, pursuing a career in the space. Thank you so much, Claudia. And I appreciate you starting to talk about not only like regulatory solutions as well as uh, mentorship opportunities. Um, you know, it's so important that this work is intergenerational and that means, you know, sharing knowledge across generations and mentoring, uh, mentorship through generations and learning goes across the table. So appreciate you mentioning that. Um, so we're going to pivot to the next round of questions. And this next round of questions, um, we have specific questions for local folks and our global folks on the panel. Um, so this next question is for um, Claudia and Avni. 
Um, so the question is around the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, we know that the CLCPA is New York State's landmark climate legislation, which sets very ambitious emissions reductions and clean energy targets um, mandates. Um, we, what do you think would make us miss our state climate goals? How are corporations around the state either participating in or actively hindering these goals? And I'll put this question into the chat. Um, can we hand it over to Avni to open us up? Sure. So, yeah, big question. <laughs> um, I think many of us working... Um, working in the utility regulatory space. Um, so that is one of Agree's big pieces of um, work is um, in intervening in what's called a rate case. Um, won't go too into that because it's frankly wonky and not fun to be a part of. Um, but it's basically where we, um, you know, intervene and actually negotiate directly with a lot of the gas utilities around the state um, to actually hold them to decarbonization goals, hold them to retiring gas pipelines, or in some cases, stopping them from even building that pipeline in the first place. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that we're doing there, um, because I think, honestly, one of the biggest things that would make us miss our statewide climate goals is that these utilities are just allowed to um, build false solutions um, rampantly across our state. Um, and that is their plan, really. Like, I, Martha, I love the hope is not a strategy because, yeah, they would love to say, yeah, we hope we can do this. Um, it's in our thoughts and prayers that we do this thing. Um, but when it comes to actually doing the hard thing and, you know, getting fracked gas out of our homes and buildings, um, they have, um, you know, a plan to feed hydrogen into the gas system. Um, which is problematic for many reasons I can go into later in the Q&A if people are interested in this. They have a plan for what's called renewable natural gas, and it's not renewable at all. It's actually just methane. Surprise, surprise. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which the gas industry is scared. They're fighting for their lives right now. They're fighting for, not their lives, they're fighting for their profits. We're fighting for our lives. Um, but they are backed into a corner. They see what they could lose at this point. Um, and so they're pulling out all the stops to, um, you know, beat us through misinformation and fear mongering. Um, so one very specific example that um, Agree is um, kind of uh, currently speaking out on this and um, doing a bunch of work um, to call this out is that um, utilities like National Fuel located in Buffalo, um, they have a lot of investments in uh, gas infrastructure. Um, and they are also responsible for a lot of um, political lobbying around um, keeping gas uh, as, you know, uh, as, as New York's number one um, heat, uh, heating fuel for buildings. Um, so they're really, um, you know, calling all of their customers. They're encouraging their customers to call um, politicians and we as ratepayers, anyone who pays a utility bill, um, are actually footing the bill for that lobbying. Um, so one of the things that we're working on in the legislative space is um, actually barring utilities from being able to do that kind of political lobbying with our money. Um, I think the other thing that would, I'll just briefly touch on um, so that I don't go over time and I'll pass it over to Claudia. Um, we're seeing um, in our in some of the reporting coming out that's looking at our 2030 goals and our progress towards them, we're seeing some of our state agencies really skip over the massive load growth that's coming from mega corporations looking at New York for their data centers, for their manufacturing, for their AI server farms, um, Micron and Microsoft and some crypto mining um, companies are just a few of those culprits, but, um, this is really going to massively push up um, our load consumption or electricity consumption. Um, and I think our state agencies are really not interested in having a public conversation about this because they don't actually want the public looking at how much these corporations are getting for free off the backs of New Yorkers. So I think we need to kind of talk about like, how much are we 
the rate payers on the hook for corporations and infrastructure that serves them, how much should they be contributing towards our renewable energy goals um, and how to get them to actually do that? I'll pass it to Claudia. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess I mentioned earlier, I work at the um, member-based energy storage trade group called New York Best, so, but maybe it would be helpful to just first give a little bit of context on what energy storage is and why it's important. Um, so many of you probably know energy storage is really a critical enabling technology for the clean energy transition. Um, energy storage can displace peaker plants. It can directly contribute to cleaner air, especially in low income neighborhoods um, where polluting facilities are often located, at least in New York State. Um, and in New York, energy storage can also help make sure we comply with the Department of Environmental Conservation's peaker rule. Um, which said that the dirtiest power plants have to retire by 2025, but several of them in New York City are going to be kept online for reliability reasons. Um, but bringing online more energy storage capacity can help solve that reliability concern. Um, and then in addition, as you know, more solar and wind intermittent resources come onto the grid, we need to make sure that power continues to be reliable and available um, when we need it, even if it's not windy or sunny outside. Um, so energy storage can really be a game changing resource and we know we're going to need a lot of it to meet the mandates of the Climate Act. Um, but this is pretty much the first time in history, in the history of electricity, that we're going to be relying on energy storage at such a large scale. And there's a lot of challenges with, com you know, that come with doing something for the first time. So some of those challenges are on the permitting and regulation side, especially as authorities figure out how to review and permit these systems. Um, on the financing side, as we figure out how to develop the market structures needed to really fully capture the value that these technologies offer to the grid. Um, and then on the communication side, the community engagement side, um, you know, people fear change. So there's been a lot of pushback against energy storage, just like there's a lot of pushback against solar and wind. Um, so we have a lot of work to do on educating people why this technology is so important to our energy transition and to our future. Um, so I guess looking forward, we have a bunch of different priorities. One is kind of process based. So creating transparent and streamlined permitting and interconnection processes that really uphold strict safety standards, um, improve consistency across the state. So we're working closely with state and local officials and utilities to help make that happen. Um, the second pillar is markets. So right now, as I've kind of alluded to the electricity market is really designed for fossil based generators. So renewables and storage are kind of jamming themselves in there, but we need uh, a more holistic transformation of how our electricity markets are structured to capture the multi-layered value that energy storage offers the grid and really pay them for that in the marketplace. Um, and then the third is incentive based. So while we fix the market issue, we kind of need stronger incentives to make sure that projects can pencil in New York and that we can achieve our ambitious clean energy targets, which requires deployment ASAP really fast. Um, we were super excited to see the energy storage roadmap was approved by the state's public service commission this past summer. So that unlocks nearly $2 billion in incentives for energy storage in New York uh, in support of our 2030 goals. Um, so we'll be working really closely with the state to make sure that the programs associated with that, uh, pro uh, the roadmap are rolled out efficiently. Um, so it's an exciting time for energy storage, but it's also kind of a tough time um, in terms of what would make us miss our climate goals. So across the state, we've seen dozens of local moratoria that have collectively prevented over one gigawatt of energy storage from being constructed. Um, and to put that into context, you know, the state is aiming for six gigawatts by 2030, and we currently have less than half a gigawatt constructed. So one gigawatt in moratoria is a pretty big deal. Um, a lot of those moratoria are driven by fear and misinformation. So there's definitely a lot of room for industry to improve in terms of how we're communicating with host communities of these systems. Um, but a lot of it is also nimbyism and kind of political bias against green energy, which is a much harder nut to crack. Um, on the safety side, uh, the state is currently undergoing an amendment of the fire code to ensure that these systems are held to the highest safety standards. So hopefully that will help ease some people's concerns. Um, and then I guess in general, uh, apart from safety, there's been a lot of confusion and inconsistency when it comes to permitting energy storage systems. It requires a lot of technical expertise that frankly, like small, especially rural towns don't necessarily have. Um, so we're looking at ways of fixing that and potentially including uh, a solution to have permitting go through the state's Office of Renewable Energy Siting or ORES, which is how large renewables get cited in the state, um, rather than having them be cited piecemeal through local jurisdictions. So those are just a couple of the different um, 
policy priorities that we have going on. But yeah, it's definitely an ex exciting time for energy storage in New York, for sure. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you so much, Avni, for sharing that. I mean, this so like you said, there's so much going on in New York State. So just even trying to keep up with all of that, um, you know, from rate cases to regulatory frameworks to how, you know, how incentives or subsidies are flowing to fossil fuel developers and, you know, incentives for, for energy storage, like, all of these are really important pieces, and um, we'll be sharing a, a resource um, after this conversation with more links to to different reports and websites um, for folks on the line who, um, you know, want to learn more about any of these topics that were brought up today because there's just so much um, good topics that we can't fully go into everything. But I appreciate you bringing um, so many important points up. So the next question, pivoting to the global perspective for Martha and Lena. Um, is we know that emissions are not contained by nation. There are local and global impacts of pollution. So on a global level, what are some of the specific challenges in trying to hold the largest polluters accountable? What are the equity issues? And how do you see global convenings, like the Conference of Parties, COP, playing a role in these efforts? Um, maybe you can hand it over to Elena to open this up. Sure, happy to. Thank you. Um, I think the first thing I'll I'll mention, um, given that we're talking about the global scale, um, the United Nations is really the stage for uh, countries to come together and negotiate. It, it was originally set up as a peacekeeping entity and has served uh, for other reasons uh, over the decades. Um, but it was set up in 1945, and the, the UNFCCC, the UN agency that helps uh, work on climate change specifically, was set up in 1992. And if we think about our world in 19 1992, and we think about our world today, a lot has changed. Um, but honestly, little has changed in the way the UN is set up and that the countries negotiate and work together. And so I think a little bit of calling it an antiquated system is probably accurate. And there is a UN reform underway currently. Um, a, a big part of the equity issue here is that First off, there's a debate internally about uh, developed versus developing countries and where does the responsibility stand and how do they share that responsibility? But uh, then if you look at this from an emissions perspective, the top 10 emitting countries emit around 60%, more than 60% of emissions globally. Um, and so this just really complicates uh, the actual accounting of emissions and responsibility. Also, to what year are you talking and accounting for emissions for, uh, historical emissions versus current emissions, and then the added complexity of projected emissions. So we can now kind of looking at the industrial policy and the projected population growth of some countries, there are countries where we expect in the future to have growing emissions. So how do you balance all of that? And then also not only in the commitments and the uh, efforts to decarbonize, then get it paid for and share in the cost allocation um, for, for enabling the transition. Um, and then I think the last point I'll mention is, is the accounting and transparency, because again, we're gonna see a lot of this specifically this year at COP. Um, who, it's not only who pays what, but then also how and through what mechanisms. And so we're talking about potentially scaling climate finance um, in the billions of dollars. And so where does that money get funneled to? Who do we trust to manage that money, allocate that money, do the accounting and reporting uh, for those monies? These, this is a huge issue um, and something that the UN is currently grappling with. And I'm somewhat hopeful myself that in the next two months, we'll hear some progress made on this front. Um, but I think there's also the challenge of just our current geopolitical environment. Um, two of the biggest emitters globally is China and the US and their relationship right now is, is not great, um, let alone getting them to come together to negotiate on climate. Um, so this really is bleeding into the climate negotiations as well and, and really holding us back. Um, Marta, I know you have other things to add here. Yeah, I mean, I think this is such a, I mean, it's a big question, right? There's just so many different ways to answer it. Um, I'll try to just answer everything in one go. And um, I think I'll hit all the points raised in the questions. But, um, you know, COP28, or, which happened in Dubai last December, um, or this past December, rather, gave a really big signal um, to triple renewables and phase out fossils um, by mid-century 
um, this is compatible with the science-based path to net zero um, and, you know, a habitable future for us all. Um, you know, we just had the Pact for the Future just got agreed to yesterday, um, which, you know, the international relations person inside me is just like geeking out about that because it's a really big deal. Um, you know, it's, it was the put up or shut up moment for the UN and the UN said, yeah, we're going to try to be better and make this body more effective through, you know, these changes that we're going to make. Um so it's a pretty big deal. Um, we'll be linking to that in that document we're gonna send um, with links. So I won't go too much into that. There's also um, a potential global plastics tree is gonna happen in November. And plastics are one of those things we don't think about how petroleum is used for that, but actually like the lion's share of all plastic is from petrochemicals. So all the microplastics that's inside our bodies that like every scary, it's like, I wish it were science fiction, but it's science fact. Um, we, like there's all these science articles now about how there's particles of plastic in like human fetuses and brain cells. Um, that's all petrochemical stuff. So a global plastics treaty this November is a big freaking deal. Um, and it would affect like the demand use um, and life cycles. And it would, instead of it being pucked to us as like the consumers to recycle when re like maybe recycling is defunct, it's going to be more um, hinged on the producers to come up with some sort of end use cycle. Anyway, so those are pretty big deal. In terms of some inequities, there's some under the radar stuff around the G20, the 20 wealthiest countries on the planet. Um, which is like now going to be expanding to include the African Union. Um, so it's going to be like the G21. But anyway, there's an agenda to potentially tax super wealthy people um, because the inequities in our missions are gross um, in economic terms, but also in actual terms. It's pretty disgusting. Um, so <laughs> the wealthiest 1% create more emissions than the poorest 66% on the planet. Um, this is something that is it should be mentioned more and more in dialogues but often like it kind of gets lost in the weeds of all the other stuff but um there are gross inequities between nations but also within nations right like i'm not elon musk um i'm not going to be projected to be earning uh, a trillion dollars sometime in the next before the end of this decade um but also, you know, money, and I think Elena really touched on the money aspect. Um, I think the only thing to just that I would add is just that, you know, the poorer you are as a nation, the worse the terms. Um, you have higher interest rates that you have to pay. You have less favorable terms um, for just loans. If you're getting loans from a private bank as a nation, or if you're getting loans from the IMF or the World Bank. Um, and yeah, it's it it's a little ridiculous um um and the pact for the future did involve a lot of stuff around finance so that sends a pretty big signal ahead of cop 29 which is happening in november it feels so weird to have a cop in november i have to say because like usually it's in december i don't know if baku is like inhospitable in december i don't know what the deal is with that but um but yeah, the NCQG or the new collaborative quantified goal is going to replace that $100 billion goal, which, you know, in 2009 at Copenhagen, when that was decided, we weren't living in our present climate reality. So this is going to really change the game in terms of um, de uh, emerging and developing economies to understand what they could access. Um, and that will set their nationally determined contributions, which is going to um, have to be due ahead of COP30 in Brazil. So all these kind of different moving parts, some good stuff, some bad stuff. Um, but yeah, I think I answered the question, right? Yes, thank you so much, Martha and Elena, for bringing in that global perspective uh, of how countries are talking about these issues and just also highlighting, you know, bringing in the conversation on plastics and highlighting the disparity across, you know, the, the big polluting countries and the less polluting countries and the impact and the impacted most impacted communities. So appreciate that.
Um, we're going to pivot now to our next round of questions. We're doing a lightning round of questions, which each of the answers will be either one, one to three words. So the first question is a yes or no. Yes or no question. It's going to be tough. I, I can only let you know that. Um, so before I forget, the, the order will be Martha, Claudia, Elena, and Avni for the first question. I wrote this all down, so I would not forget the order. So that again, the first question Martha, Claudia, Elena, and Avni. So first question, yes or no. With existing local policies, that could be city and state, and global commitments, are we on track to achieving a net zero economy? No. No, but I don't think there will ever be a one and done, we did it moment. Sorry, I couldn't help it. No. It pains me to agree with the panelists, but no. Okay. Next next question. Um, and so for this round, it will go Avni, Martha, Claudia, Elena. And this is a one to three word answer. One to three words. What is missing from the clean energy transition conversation? Fracked gas is currently mandated. I know that was five words. You try. A fracked word. Thank you. Um, I would say um, critical resources, uh, critical resource mining, and environmental impacts. Um, and just to add a little bit something extra. Um, Lithium and other things are in arid places and a lot of water is used in mining. So as arid places become more water scarce, this mining is going to make water even more precious for um, mining communities. Yeah, Claudia and then Elena. Sorry, I forgot the order. Um, <laughs> I was going to say the fact that emissions are cumulative so every delay in emissions reductions means that even more reduction will be required down the line to achieve climate stability. And I feel like for the energy transition, we're very much focused on the, the year and not necessarily the cumulative emissions. Mm -hmm. I'll say sovereign fossil states. Thank you. No, you can see, you can see every one of the panel. Just, it's so hard. One to three words. There's so much brilliance in the room and so much expertise. I, I see you guys struggling, struggling to, to keep it short, but this is what makes it fun. Um, so we have two more, two more in the lightning round, and then we'll go to our closing section. Um, so this is, again, one to three words. Um, the order will be Elena, Avni, Martha, and Claudia. So what technology or model are you most interested in or excited about? Uh, virtual power plants. Happy? Sorry, I forgot the order, even though you said it like not 20 seconds ago. <laughs> um, thermal energy networks. Ooh, Martha? I'm going to say EV battery recycling. Long duration energy storage. Ooh, okay. So maybe we have the answer here. Folks, we have a solution. We, we're going to write this all down, put a proposal together. I loved all of that. Um, okay, so the last question the lightning round. Again, one to three words. Um, I'm going to say the question first, and then I'll go to the order. So what other word or words come to mind when you hear energy justice? Um, and the order be Claudia, Elena, Avni, and Martha. Healthy and happy. Affordability and jobs. Make the shareholders pay. Um, <clears throat> access, but access is not accessibility. Love it. 
I love all those answers. Thank you guys so much for um, indulging us in this lightning round. So we're coming to our closing questions um, before we go into audience Q&A. Um, I think for the sake of time, we're gonna also do something fun for this closing question. Um, so we know this election is around the corner. We also know that none of our organizations are going to be endorsing um, candidates. But within that context of, you know, change and investment um, and so much work that needs to be done, these questions, the next few questions are really in the realm of, of doubling down on what's next. What are we looking forward to? What are some of the critical things that we need to either be doing or not doing in the next five, one to five years as we're coming up to one of our big first, you know, um, target years, which is 2030. Um, so I'm going to um, put the questions in the chat. We have three questions and we want to go around the room and you are free to pick whichever question um, speaks to your soul and which that you want to answer, but we're each going to answer one question. So we have, what are the key challenges to achieving a just energy transition? What do we, um, oh, sorry, how do we embed justice within the inevitable energy transition? Or what solutions already exist that could be expanded upon for greater impact? Um, and we're gonna, let's see, go, maybe go backwards in order from what we just did. So um, I'll kick it over to you, Martha, um, to choose your adventure for a closing question. Um, I love this. It's like one of those uh, books we had when we were kids, like choose your own story. Um, I think I'll take, I'll take the first question. Um, you know, there are so many different challenges for achieving a just energy transition. I think it really comes down to three things. Um, we've talked about a couple of them um, at some length, but um, maybe not all three. I think number one is climate finance. Like we can't do anything if there's no money. Um, money makes the world go round. We can't barter our way um, towards creating new jobs and and everything else, right? So the finance piece has to be there. Um, the critical resources will need to be there. We will con like we are going to continue to need to extract resources. There is a real link between extractivism and authoritarianism and a lot of other bad isms. So how those resources are mined really matters. Um, and technology transfers. Um, the majority of trade transfers that happen are among wealthy nations and wealthy nations. And I'm including China with wealthy nations because China is the world's second largest economy. So let's just stop pretending like it's a emerging economy because they have a poverty problem just like the US um, and that's okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, wealthy nations control the patents for the technologies. They control the um, mining companies that may exist and they control the finance. So there really needs to be more equity built into these existing systems because right now the way that they function, um, you know, pre-packed, which just happened yesterday, um, is with inequity embedded. So we need to break um, these cycles that we're in. Thank you, Martha. I pass it over to Apni. Choose your adventure. Sure. Um, I think I'm going to do the key challenges to achieving a just energy transition because I um, said something very uh, mysterious in, my, in one of the lightning round <laughs> answers, and I want to kind of expand on that. So one of the things I said was fracked gas is currently mandated, um, and it really basically is in New York State public service law. Um, so one of the biggest things that agree um, is working on because one one of the things that we've noticed working in the building and decarb space for like the last decade, um, as we've been doing the outreach and education to um, households and building owners, you know, building by building, we've noticed that it's just really slow. It takes a lot of effort and conversation and education, and it's all you know worthwhile to be like building a stronger community and community networks and especially like building um direct relationships with people in our neighborhoods who are struggling with their energy bills and other home energy um comfort issues um comfort and health issues 
Um, but at the same time, we are also not able to reach the number of households that we need to reach in order to meaningfully reduce our emissions from the building sector um, if we have to keep doing this house by house approach. And so that's why, um, you know, geothermal energy networks is my technology of choice because it's a really exciting way to massively scale up entire neighborhoods and communities um, to this awesome, ultra modern, efficient, clean, affordable 21st century heating and cooling. Um, but a big barrier to that is that, wouldn't you know it, the gas utilities aren't exactly on board with um, turning over a large portion of their customer segment to all the electric utilities um, or to electrifying and getting off of gas um, because they do make a profit through building gas infrastructure. And so um, one of the pieces of legislation that we're going to be working on and fighting for this coming legislative session is called the New York Heat Act, which basically removes that fracked gas mandate from our public service law and enables the utilities to serve energy, be obligated to serve energy and not have to serve gas. Um, and so that's really going to remove a lot of the legal and policy barriers to being able to massively scale up the transition. And I've just noticed it's that time of year where you can be sitting in the sunlight and then all of a sudden you're sitting in the dark. So I'm going to go turn on the light and I'll pass it to the next panelist. Thanks, Daphne. Let's pass it over to Alina. All right, I'm going to try to answer all three with the same answer uh, or a same theme at least. Um, but I think so one of the biggest challenges, so I really think miseducation, misinformation rather, um, and capacity gaps. We're hearing about the workforce of the future and the skills that are missing and then the workers that are missing in order to fill that gap and really be uh, part of the energy transition. Um, so that's kind of a two pronged answer, but it really is about education that's missing there uh, around the energy transition. And then uh, how do we embed just uh, justice in the energy transition. It's really about bringing everyone along. So this includes the trade schools, this includes the oil and gas industry, um, and it includes building value chains. Uh, so not just about training the workforce of the future or building new energy, but really using, working with local communities, including them in the transition and making sure that they're part of uh, that whole process. And then on the third one, on what solutions already exist. Uh, being part of SDSN, we have a, a, the SDG Academy. Uh, I think it has more than 35 massive open online courses at this point in time, uh, which are free and open to uh, sign up for. There's obviously a huge amount of these resources online now, which I think is a, just a really cool revolution we're in uh, as far as access to education. And so I encourage everyone to check that out um, and learn more. Uh, but I have a lot of hope for um, online courses courses in the future and helping enable the transition. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, and it's super fun that you got all three there. Um, I'm going to pass over to Claudia to help um, finish us out. Yeah, I was going to go in a really similar vein, Elena. So I definitely agree. Education has a huge role to play in this, um, both educating the general public um, potentially integrating clean energy uh, curricula into school systems like the public Department of Education um, curricula, you know, it's good to get them early. You know, if I try to throw out a plastic water bottle because there's no recycling and like a little kid in my life, you can be like, you have to recycle that because it's been drilled into them since kindergarten. So I feel like we need to get um, kids learning early about what is solar, what is wind, what is energy storage? Why are these technologies so important and how can you support them? Because um, I really think that that's going to help create the cultural shift that's going to be needed in order to embrace clean energy systems being built um, everywhere. Because we're going to need to site sources closer to load and we're going to need to electrify a lot of things. We're going to have a lot of new electric infrastructure in our lives and we need to not have a knee jerk reaction of like, this is bad. I don't want I don't want to see this in my backyard. Um, I think education on the flip side of educating policymakers and decision makers and industry representatives about the tenants of what 
a just and inclusive energy transition looks like and how we can rethink existing systems to achieve that um, is just as important. And I think we've got a lot of work to do within our own organizations and our own companies um, to make sure that we help people grow in this space. I think there's a lot of folks who are very interested in learning more and willing to hear the concepts, but just haven't necessarily been exposed to it yet. So um, starting, you know, at baseline and, and making sure we're looking inward at our own organizations to better um, advance the, the the justice portions of what we need to see within the energy transition. I also like that you included inevitable in this uh, question, very optimistic, but, uh, you know, we'll go with it. We, we got to get our we got to get our optimism in there when we can. But I appreciate all of your answers, and I really love that you brought up the the self transformation part too. There's so much, um, all of you all, and so much, so many of you that have tuned in tonight um, are doing working around breaking down those systemic and structural and procedural barriers to clean energy and equity. But another important piece of that is the personal and self transformation piece of that that we have to be we each as individuals also have to be catalysts and models of that change. So I appreciate you bringing that to the conversation. Um, that concludes all of the planned questions um, for our panelists. So this is the time that if you um, are an attendee and you have a question for our panelists, you can go ahead and use the raise hand function or, or add your question to the chat. We'll give folks um, a minute or so um, to get your questions. And I have um, I have a question to help us kick off kick off um, the Q&A section. Um, and so that question is um, around Climate Week, because I know that this is not the only event that, that many folks, both panelists and attendees are going to. And so it's the beginning of Climate Week and it already seems like there've been so many amazing events. Um, is there something that you've heard or learned thus far from another event that really resonated with you? And to the panelists, feel free to unmute um, as, as you please. I'm happy to kick this off. Um, it is really new. I actually went to Elena's um, one of the two days of workshops that um, SDSN was doing, um, or it was like multiple pa panels each day. But um, I have to say, no offense, um, Elena, um, and I appreciate that we're both wearing the same color. That was not coordinated. Um, I think it was the event that I went to today at the new school um, with Stacey Abrams was really excellent um it was a lot of stuff as an expert it's like you you go to these things and you're like okay I'm hearing a lot of this stuff I already know but sometimes things are presented in a way that's maybe inspiring or makes you have new ideas about maybe work that you want to be doing or 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 writing or whatever but um that was really interesting um that throughout that event which was very like hippy dippy event with a lot of different things happening before it got to Stacey Abrams but um, kind of the underpinning was that we should move from framing climate as a want. So something that's like nice to have, like it'd be nice to have a clean climate, whatever, um, to something we need because we all need clean water. We all need clean air. We all need better insulated homes. We all need a society that functions and can allow us to thrive and to have better, a better shot for future generations. That's what it's all about. Right. Um, and you know, we're the first generation to witness climate um, impacts and shocks, and we're the last that can do something about it. So let's do something about it and let's have more urgency about it. Thanks, Martha. I was there too. I'm sad I didn't see you, but um... we didn't see Wait, what? <laughs> but I we're see moonlighting with their sustainability department, basically, like. No, I see Mario has his hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I'm trying to make sure the unmuting works. Mario, can you unmute? Okay, good. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Um, I guess like one question, I've I worked in electrical engineering with the focus in solar and renew renewables. And I noticed like a lot of times large solar and wind farms tend to be geographic specific. So for example, I recently saw that in China, there's a huge uh, solar farm in the desert. 
but then only people that are nearby really have access. And I don't know how, whether it's in the US or other countries, that's kind of decided, but are there kind of ways to distribute renewable energy more equally across a country or uh, different countries to make sure everyone has access to it? I can jump in on that one. Thanks, Mario. Great question. Um, so in New York State, we have what has been referred to as the tale of two grids, because we've got an upstate grid that is exceedingly clean. There's lots of uh, clean energy resources, not just solar and wind, but also hydro and uh, hydro and nuclear, which is, you know, debates on how you want clean, you want to classify that, but zero emission. Um, and then downstate, New York City and Long Island are over 90% fossil dependent. So part of that is just like what you're mentioning, geographic constraints. So downstate is much more densely populated, don't have the same room to put in large solar farms or, or don't have the same hydro resources. Um, there's a couple of different things that New York at least is doing to combat that. One is transmission. So having long distance transmission lines can be a game changer in unbottling some of that clean energy and allowing it to translate from upstate to downstate and bring some of that those cleaner electrons down um, to displace the, the dirtier fossil plants downstate. Um, and then the second is, I guess, a diversity of resources. So uh, we might not have as much room for utility scale solar or hydro, but we do have a lot of uh, coastline. So in New York City and Long Island, the opportunity for offshore wind is pretty tremendous. Um, so New York State has been pursuing that pretty aggressively and will be looking to, again, long distance transmission lines to bring the power from you know, 70 plus miles out at sea uh, on, to substations on land. Thanks, Claudia. Lena, did you want to jump in on that answer? Yeah, th that was a great answer. I wanted to just add to it um, in the with the same answer, the grid, but also say, so a few years ago, we did a study nationally, and it turns out that there is really great high quality wind in the Midwest, um, and there is really great high quality solar in the Southeast. Um, and they actually, throughout the year, at different times in the year, balance each other when they are the strongest and weakest. And so if you systemically connected these two regions with the grid, uh, you could really enable a huge scale of those two technologies in those regions. So that kind of really larger systems thinking, I think, needs to be part of the solution. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Claudia, for those answers. I see, Druven, that your hand is up. Do you want to come up uh, mute and ask your question? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much. It was a great insight on the screen, like transition. Uh, you like, I wanted to know about what are your thoughts on how developing countries, like where many communities rely on coal for their jobs and, you know, affordable energy. And when the countries don't have financial resources to invest in new technologies and like, how can they, you know, without causing any economic hardship or people leaving their jobs behind can transition to, you know, better and clean energy. I can speak a little bit about, um, not not coal specifically. I'm not an expert on coal plant decommissioning, um, but very briefly on on that, I I do think that there is a, a big conversation around, you know, corporate responsibility and government responsibility to decommission these assets and transition workers, um, because yeah, you're right that. Um, people without thinking about the people who are going to be displaced from their livelihoods, that is a very real possibility and does happen. Um, and so what is the responsibility of the corporations that own these coal plants in ensuring that um, these workers who often have very transferable skills have a place in building new um, distributed assets? Um, what I was going to speak to is, is more on the, um, uh, fracked gas side of things where, um, you know, one of the reasons I'm also so excited about geothermal energy networks um, is because there is a really great possibility to transition um, workers from working on gas pipelines and um, servicing gas pipes to um, installing thermal energy networks and um, pipes that don't carry fracked gas, but carry water or some kind of ambient fluid instead. So um, that's just one example of a way that you can 
seek those transferable skills, work with unions and work with organized labor, not just unions, because that's one way of organizing labor, but there's lots of lots of ways to do that. Um, but we're really working with workers to understand what's going to be possible, what is going to be, um, you know, a, a, a just transition that's going to allow them to um, continue on a career path, um, but also be leaders in a clean energy transition. And I'll pass it over to Elena, who will also put, put her hand up. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to share a quick example as well. So part of my job is working with the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition and where we give guidance to various countries and stakeholders within the UN system on uh, the energy transition. Um, and working with RMI and UNDP in Kenya, one issue we realized specifically in an emerging economy is kind of a chicken and egg problem with large scale renewables. So you're talking about utility scale renewables, which gets the cost down for the users, but that's only if you have an off taker for that energy. And so where you have these emerging economies that don't have these big industrial um, uh, marketplaces, you kind of don't know where to start. And so we've been working around this concept of produ uh, productive use energy. So it's where you marry in an energy strategy with an industrial strategy of a country so that you're really building up that demand for the energy while you're also building the supply for it. And then also helping the local economy to develop as well by building an industrial uh, mar uh, work workforce and workplace. Um, so check out our website. I think I included in the links afterwards, but we have a paper about productive use energy that will answer exactly the question you just asked. Martha, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I just want to quickly add, um, there are some interesting examples of just energy transition partnerships um, in a lot of, well, and only four countries have these been like, it's a very new thing. Have they been piloted? Um, but the whole kind of in, in each example, it's typically how can we as like all these global institutions help um, basically facilitate um, multilateral and private investment partnerships that can help um, transition power plants off coal. So often in these scenarios, it's not coal to renewables, it's coal to nat natural gas because it's easier to make that switch in the power plant. Um, and then the plan is to, you know, stage it out so that within a decade, it'll be a renewable plant. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to check out some Just Energy Transition Partnership examples. There are, um, I think the example from Indonesia might be the most um, aligned with this because it's like specific to a coal plant um, and each country has like their own specific kind of projects that are undergoing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Claudia, did you want to jump in before I moved on to the next question? Okay, sounds good. Sonia, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Hi, this is Sanya, and I'm an architect and uh, also a first year SES graduate student. Um, my uh, focus always has been inclined towards indigenous and marginalized communities, and hence, I was wondering uh, that how do you all think that uh, uh, global climate policy can ensure that uh, indigenous communities or like uh, historically marginalized communities can both benefit from uh, and contribute to just energy transitions? And uh, additionally, I also wanted to know that what are some of the strategies that can be employed to ensure that the financial burden of transitioning to clean energy does not disproportionately fall on low-income populations and developing countries? I'm happy to start on this one. It's a great question, Sonia, and it's one that everyone is grappling with because I think it isn't one that has a, a perfect answer at this point. Um, in New York State, we passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, also known as the Climate Act, in 2019. And it does um, go pretty far in that it directly and explicitly um, mandates equity considerations in the climate transition. So it requires 35% of the benefits and a goal of 40% of the benefits to be directed to uh, disadvantaged communities within New York State. 
uh, disadvantaged communities would include indigenous populations historically marginalized. There, I think, were 40 or so different indicators used to define what constitutes a disadvantaged community, uh, looking at income, climate risk, uh, historical uh, fossil fuel infrastructure burden, things like that. Um, and now that the communities have been defined, there's the next effort of definition, like what does a benefit count as? So there's sort of the administrative challenges of how do you actually make sure that that is achieved in practice. But I do think that it's required all of the programs and policies and incentives and funding coming out of the Climate Act to look at it through that frame and say, okay, how do we ensure that disadvantaged communities are you know, getting the benefits of whatever policy this is? And um, what are some additional carve outs or additional programs that we can use to really make sure that disadvantaged communities are, are getting um, the incentives appropriately, or if you're, you know, de designing a new workforce development program, how do we make sure that it's accessible for people from these marginalized communities? Um, so it's a step in the right direction. It's definitely not perfect. And, you know, every new policy requires sort of a, a new uh, grappling with how are we going to make sure that this is uh, achieved in a just and equitable way. Um, but it's at least one model that could uh, potentially be used in, in other places as a starting point. Avni, do you want to jump in? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick because I know we're coming up on seven o'clock. Um, but yeah, this is just another place that I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the cost of the gas system. I have um, i don't know if it's really been mentioned yet, but um, there's something called the utility death spiral. <laughs> it sounds really scary and I'm, I'm not trying to fear monger, but the, the point of it is basically that um, as customers um, leave the gas system, and, and we're seeing this happen more and more, people are really interested in electrification and heat pumps, um, and higher income homes are deciding to do this of their own free will. As that happens, the gas system and what people, you know, what rate payers have to pay to um, ensure that utilities don't lose money on those bad investments, which are honestly going to be stranded assets like pretty soon, in order to make sure that the gas utilities you know, make back their profit, rate payers are going to have to pay more and more and more over the coming years. And that's why we're seeing so many people across New York state getting hit with higher and higher gas bills um, because of those rate hikes in order to pay off the assets of the gas system. And so I think in order to, in order to avoid low-income households um, bearing the burden and bearing the brunt of those impacts, we have to prioritize those households getting off of gas um, immediately so that they're not the ones left holding the bag. And I'll pass it to Martha. Um, thank you. Um, I I just want to touch on a couple of things because obviously, like we've already talked about, so many interesting things that can help answer this question, but. Um, for rural communities, you know, microgrids are an opportunity to connect rural communities to energy access um, without the added infrastructure burdens of having to, like, build power lines across great distances, um, you know, to and from a power plants that maybe, you know, are providing energy access for the city, whatever the city is, but not for the rural community, Um and I will just say that our finance really has to transition um, towards more grants. Um, you know, grants are the thing we get for free. Um, but also, even if loans are given, maybe we need to have more creative financing tools. Like there are examples of debt for nature payoffs, but maybe we need to have debt for climate resiliency payoffs or debt for SDG action payoffs. So it's like, oh, okay, this nation did X, Y, Z to help achieve these particular sustainable development goals or bring energy access um, to a community or you know whatever it may be. Um, and these are some things that actually the IIED, um, which is a UK-based think tank, um, they do a lot of work around um, like creative financing um, for and, and using more holistic approaches um, that like target finance in this kind of way. So, um, so yeah. Thank you for that. And with that, we're going to close out the panel. We're at the top of the hour. So I just want to give a huge 
Thank you and shout out to all of our wonderful panelists, to our sponsors and co-sponsors and hosts of this event, to all of you amazing attendees who've stayed to the end. We really appreciate you. And, you know, if anything from this conversation, we really just see that, you know, we're all fighting for not just different outcomes, but, you know, we're, we're talking about the really deep work that happens, that needs to happen in terms of changing systems, changing processes, who's making decisions, how money is being moved. And that's not just, it's not enough to invest um, to invest money. It's about accessibility, like you said, Martha, and who has access to resources, decision-making and power. And we hope to do that hand in hand and collaboratively to make sure that this a clean energy transition can truly be a just transition. So again, just wanna appreciate everyone's time and um, attention and um, please check out more events that Pat's putting on this week and um, hope everyone has a lovely climate week. Thank you. Yeah, everybody can unmute and clap if, at this time. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks everyone. Good Thank, night. You. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.